All right, everybody. Now is the moment you've all been waiting for. So, as I said before, we have an incredible couple of panels for you. The entire colorectal cancer community is coming together on these two panels. Um, and to moderate, we are very lucky to have Cliff Goodman with us. Yeah, he has 30, over 30 years of experience in healthcare. He is an internationally recognized healthcare policy moderator. And he is going to be moderating this, what I'm sure is going to be fabulous, robust discussion of the coral rectal cancer community. So, Cliff. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, thanks, everybody. I really please, I'm very, very pleased to be here as part of this uh, meeting. You're in the right place, the right time, the right view, for many reasons about which we will hear some. Uh, this is an opportune juncture to make an impact, a set of impacts. A lot is happening economically, socially, <coughs> medically, uh, on the research side. This is the point, tip of the spear, time to make a difference. This panel is entitled, Choose Your Own Adventure, The Many Roads to Community Engagement. Uh, we are very pleased, in fact, honored to be joined by a set of panelists, all of whom triggered their own organization. They said, I've got to do something. These are founders. And so uh, I've got great longitudinal respect and great respect for their innovation and drive. This is something that for very good reason is contagious. Uh, we've got an hour for this session. We're gonna try to save about eight or 10 minutes at the very end for audience Q&A. We'll please hold our, our questions until then if you don't mind. Um, and what we're gonna focus on for this, for this particular panel is why did you found your organization? What has made it distinctive? What's made it distinctive in this field? And they'll have a bunch of cross-cutting questions on things like breadth of colon cancer covered awareness, access issues, maybe fundraising, research, and perhaps some other issues along the way. And uh, setting a very good example will be at your far left, Candace Henry. And I'm gonna ask each one of our panels to provide a three minute max, that's 180 seconds, three minute max <laughs> overview of why they founded the organization and what is distinctive about it in this space. Candace Henley. So um, I founded the Blue Hat Foundation because something tragic happened to me. And there were no faces of minorities surviving colon cancer under the age of 50 when I researched. And so it became something that I needed to do um, for other minority uh, individuals looking to find faces that look like them. And Every time I did research, it showed it, everyone was either over 50 or over 60, um, either a black or white male or black or white female over the age of 65. And none of that helped me. And so when I started re doing research, I'm like, you know what, I really need to be, be a face because somebody needs to see me. And so I started the Blue Hat Foundation because of the tragedy. Um, and the Blue Hat Foundation uh, raises awareness of colorectal cancer in minority and medically underserved communities, specifically because there is the highest rate of uh, incidence of diagnosis and death in these communities. And so what makes us different is that we make colorectal cancer awareness fashionable by wearing blue hats and bow ties in churches. And so I started it eight years ago in my church with just my family members wanting to do something that was different, that was non-threatening, and that would start a conversation about colorectal cancer. And so when my family joined me in finally wearing the blue hats to church, it did prompt the question as to why are you all wearing those blue hats? And my pastor said, we had the blue hat society, you know, here at church. And so that prompted the questions as to why we were wearing blue hats. And it also uh, made my family accidental advocate. So when that question was asked before I could ask, they said, oh yeah, she's a cancer survivor. And that started the uh, movement as we like to call it. Inspiring as it is, and I know about the hats in church too. I mean, that, yes. that made a real impact there. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tasha Keel. Um, I have notes here, so I wanna make sure I stick to my three minutes. So oh. um, in January- Prepared, this oh. is a leader. <laughs> She's got her notes, right. And I don't wanna ramble. So in January 2013, my mother in love, I call her my mother in love because she was just really, really amazing. Um, she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer at the age of 56. Um, they told her at that time that if she was able to withstand the chemotherapy, they could give her a maximum of two years to live, and she ended up dying a year and two months later. Um, 
And so the last thing she said to me, I don't know if you guys know this, but I'm a nurse. And so a lot of the, I guess, the end of life care, um, I spent quite a bit of time with her. And the very last thing she said to me before she died was to keep my baby busy, her son, my husband, George, uh, because he's not going to be ready for this. He's a mama's boy. You and I both know that. I know. <laughs> um, and he's just not going to be ready. And so keep him busy. You'll know when the time will be to let him grieve appropriately. And so um, just a little bit about my husband. So he was the editor-in-chief for one of the uh, largest uh, footwear publications. And um, he had amassed quite a following um, in that niche. And so he had talked to me about hosting a basketball tournament that wasn't about basketball. It was actually about the sneakers that you wore. And so I said, well, why don't we do the basketball tournament? But instead of it just being about the, the sneakers that you wear, like, let's teach people about colon cancer. So maybe this doesn't have to happen to anyone else. And so we started an Instagram account and quickly discovered we had 60,000 followers. And it was just like, all right, like, this is catching on. Let's do this. And so <laughs> we ended up um, hosting the Kick and Roll Classic Basketball event. Um, we had over 500 people show up, which was really awesome for us. First time, every any time um, doing anything like this. And um, after the event was over with, you know, we got an email saying, hey, my kid was pestering me about going to see some event they saw on Instagram. They came home and they won't stop talking to me about going to get a colonoscopy. Well, I went to get it. They found uh, polyps that I had to get removed. You guys saved my life. Thank you. And so from that, you know, um, we were like, uh, thank you. We need to, everyone then started asking us, when's y'all's next event? And I was just like, whoa. So at the time I was getting my master's and in, in school, and um, that was part of the education that I was um, currently embarking on. And so I'm like, well, why don't we start a nonprofit? And so I did the paperwork and turned everything in. And you know, we decided after looking at the research, like Candace just said, that you know, people who look like me are dying. The numbers are going up for this particular age group. And no one's speaking it in the language that I can understand. And so for us, that language is social media. And that's the reason we started our foundation. I guess that's what makes us different is because we are making something that was not easy or I guess the cool thing to talk about, the cool thing to talk about. Thank you very much, Tasha. Great combination of uh, shoes and social media. Yes. Great story. <laughs> Inspiring as it is. Yes, it is. Thank you. Martha Raymond. Hi, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to thank Angie and everyone at Fight CRC for giving all of us this platform. It's just a great opportunity, and it's great to see so many friends here again this year at Call on Congress. Um, we started the Raymond Foundation back in 1985, so before many of you probably were born. Um, but we founded the foundation in memory of my parents, uh, Margaret and Patrick Raymond, who both passed from colon cancer when they were quite young. Um, really in the prime of their lives. Um, I was just uh, a teenager when my dad passed and a senior in college when my mom passed. And at that time, you really didn't even mention the word cancer, much less the word colon cancer, because we're talking the late 70s and very early 1980s. So it was a very difficult time as we tried to raise awareness. Um, and you can, as you can imagine, there were some roadblocks al along the way. Like I said, people didn't even talk about cancer. Um, but fast forward, you know, a couple decades, and what we have decided with the Raymond Foundation is really our niche that we feel has been um, an area that there hasn't been enough attention paid to is really for caregivers. And so these past year, maybe 18 months, we've really started to develop some programming and awareness for caregivers. And one of our big initiatives this year for 2018 will be the first um, uh, Caregiver Cancer Day um, in November, which is also Caregiver Awareness Month. So that will be November 1st. And we look forward, hopefully, to working with everyone here in this room and um, you know, as many organizations as we can. And as we move forward to develop resources and support services for caregivers, because as we all know, cancer just doesn't affect the patient. It affects the whole family. So looking forward to continuing the conversation with everybody here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. Excellent. So obviously there's an emphasis there on, on caregivers. That's a, another uh, important angle there. Uh, Robin, Robin Dubin. Yes. So I am the executive director of Alive and Kickin'. And um, I just wanted to say, if anyone hasn't yet had the opportunity to ask, 
No, Dave is not here. You're stuck with me. <laughs> um, my husband Dave is a three-time cancer survivor. He has a Lynch syndrome, and he was first diagnosed with colon cancer at 29 in 1997. Um, we had a 15-month-old at home, and we knew there was a family history, but no one was talking genetics at that point. And we um, kind of got past it and went on with our very busy lives, had two more kids. Ten years later, he was diagnosed uh, with colon cancer again in 2007, um, and a couple of things happened. It was his, it kind of pushed him into patient advocacy. So he started doing many things like coming to call on Congress, getting involved with the colon club. He was Mr. January 2012, um, <laughs> which he likes to say often. Um, <laughs> and um, going to get your rear and gear races and working with people like Tom and Martha and Candace and everyone else in here. Um, and the second thing that happened was he was referred for genetic testing and we found out about Lynch syndrome. Um, a year later, he was diagnosed with a renal cell carcinoma and started seeing a high-risk oncologist a dermatologist um, besides his GI doctor, a urologist, um, and I can't even remember. There's at least five or six specialists. And we were immersed in the world of living with a hereditary cancer mutation, what that means for my husband, what it means for our children, and um, started to navigate all of that and started to meet other people that were in the Lynch syndrome world that had families that were dealing with Lynch. And we quickly realized that there were so many aspects to living with a Lynch syndrome that um, are not addressed by any one individual um, disease, or state, or organization, or tumor site, or anything like that. Um, it increased risks for many different types of cancers and all of those have to be addressed. There's um, ongoing screening, annual screening, that's much more intensive. So we started Alive and Kick-In um, and quickly focused on the needs of Lynch syndrome and hereditary cancer patients. Great, thank you very much, Robin. So another angle here, yes? So as we listen to each of our speakers about how they've started their organizations, they started in somewhat different places. You talked about Lynch syndrome, which is sort of a point of departure, and then you got into genetic screening and so forth. Uh, so let's continue then with Tom Weber. Tom? I'm Dr. Tom Weber, and uh, I was working at uh, Einstein in New York City as a, ostensibly a cancer surgeon and uh, spending a lot of time taking care of folks with colon and rectal cancer. And you know, every day uh, was another case, and I found it really very, uh, very disturbing. And we were aware that many of these diseases could be prevented with timely screening and surveillance. And uh, and then my mom was diagnosed with colon cancer, and that was kind of the last straw. So. Uh, <coughs> We organized a, a group, uh, which eventually became the Colon Cancer Challenge Foundation. We organized large public events in Central Park in New York City to raise awareness and raise funds to support young investigators, young scientists, medical students, and fellows so that they could continue their research and also attend meetings. And then in more recent years, we really, uh, we really became overwhelmed by the uh, impression that the number of young people being diagnosed was, was going up dramatically, which prompted us to reach out to actually look at the data, uh, which we did with folks like Rebecca Siegel at the American Cancer Society. And as many of you will know, Rebecca really helped lead the way to document these dramatic uh, increases. So we then stepped back and said, well, you know, we really need to promote awareness of this problem. And so uh, five years ago, we launched the annual uh, Early Age Onset Colorectal Cancer Summit in New York City. 
First year was at Sloan Kettering. Second year was at Emblem Health. Um, last year we were at NYU, and this year we're very fortunate to be working with um, Northwell Graduate Education CME, and the program will be uh, April 26th and 27th. But the point is to really try and focus attention on this issue, and we, we are devoted to promoting four fundamental strategies that we think are critical to addressing the issue, and they are as follows. Number one, risk assessment. Who is at risk? As Robin alluded to, this is largely based on family health history ascertainment. Number two, earliest possible stage diagnosis. Everyone in this room understands that many young people with colorectal cancer face delays in diagnosis. Delays in diagnosis are associated with later stage disease and not so good outcomes. Number three, effective therapies that are tailored for young people. Therapies that respect the fact that people are in the prime of life, they still want to uh, marry or have partners, have children. So these are critical issues which we have tried to address at the summit. And then number four, what is driving this, this epidemic? What is the cause? What are the causes beyond the usual suspects that people like to talk about of obesity and lack of exercise? Everyone in this room knows many, many affected young people who are not obese, who are very, very active, and so what's up? So uh, join us in April 26th and 27th where we're gonna focus on those issues. And um, I'm just really honored to be able to be here with all of you. And, and I also wanna thank Angie and her team for putting together this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. So, you know, it's interesting. Everyone's here for going to, to Capitol Hill and it's all very well arranged. And obviously it's a pretty diverse community represented. But what I'm wondering, uh, you know, if you hear about, if you listen to our speakers, they've already talked about faces that look like me, or people who look like me, or caregivers, people with a particular form, Lynch syndrome, young people. You've talked about a different set of demographic groups. And what I'm wondering then is if this is you singly or as a, an entire larger coalition, as it were, of people, how well do you think that the various demographies, the socioeconomic groups of diverse people who are at risk for colorectal cancer are being represented. Do you think we've kind of covered the whole mosaic here? Are African Americans sufficiently covered? Are people with Lynch syndrome sufficiently part of the game? Are people that are young sufficiently part? Are caregivers adequately represented? How good a job are we doing to cover the whole demography? Comments? Candace? No, we're not doing a good job. We're not doing a good job. No. And that's evident because of the reason why I started the foundation, because there were not, uh, the information was not getting disseminated to community hospitals and community clinics, which is where lower income individuals, uh, minorities, meaning African Americans, Hispanics, as well as Asian communities, they don't have access to the information that larger research hospitals do. And so the information was not being disseminated. So when I would go into the communities and I would talk to them about colon cancer and talk to them about resources that were available nationally, they'd never even heard of. Lack of awareness. And, yeah, lack, lack of awareness. And then, then there's an access issue, in meaning access to treatment, access to care. And some of the, uh, the treatment options were minimal. I mean, there, were, there was information about new research and clinical trials that weren't even available. Now you say minimal, minimal to everyone or minimal to certain groups? Minimal to certain groups. And mainly, uh, well, I, I'm, I can only speak for the communities that I've been involved in, and that was mainly with the African-American community. When I would go into, you know, to, the, to various situations, it would be like they never heard of. Uh -huh. And it would be, it's tragic, because I, I received my treatment at a great hospital, um, how, you know, but what happened to me wasn't great. Um, but if it happened to me and I was gainfully employed and had insurance and, and was financially pretty well off, imagine what's happening in lower income communities and it was worse. So we uh, still great disparities and gaps. Absolutely, still today. Mark, were you about to comment as well? Well, I, I absolutely, I think to Candace's point and, and I think we also have to um, recognize the rural communities yes. and understand that uh, upwards of 80% of individuals are treated in those community settings. So it's great if you have access to an NCI center and yes. you have that top echelon of 
you know, clinical trial information and researchers, but if you're in a community setting in a rural or, you know, underserved, maybe an urban area, mm -hmm. you don't have that access. You don't mm -hmm. have that same opportunity for, you know, and we all know that those opportunities lead to better patient outcomes. Yes. So I agree. We, we've made tremendous strides, but I do think to be, you know, fully represented from all the different demographics, we, we have a lot of work to do, and mm -hmm. that's what we're all here to do. So it's geography as well. I think absolutely. Yeah. Robin on this? Well, over um, yeah. Um, so the most recent studies indicate that one in 379 <coughs> Americans has a Lynch mutation, and over 95% of them don't know it. What percent don't know it? Over 95. Yeah. 95, 95. Most, most people don't know it. It's, it's more common than a BRCA mutation. Yeah. and no one's ever heard of it. And the only people that tend, currently tend to get genetic testing are because after a cancer diagnosis for them or someone in their family, when people finally start having those family history conversations. Um, so the awareness is not out there. Um, and people in this room may have heard of it because it's talked about much more in a room like this than anywhere else but mm. outside. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other side, just like uh, Martha said, with the um, care that they're getting, especially in a community setting, um, a lot of people when they do get diagnosed with a Lynch mutation don't really know where to turn because mm -hmm. They walk into their doctor's office and they know more about Lynch syndrome than their doctor does. Oh dear. So their doctors don't really have the tools that they need to properly screen everyone uh, in their family and they don't have access to the kind of care they, they really need to have as a Lynch patient. So we're missing diagnosis in the first place. Yeah. Then when there is a diagnosis, there's lack of awareness about where to go for treatment. And then yeah. when you go for treatment, Providers may be under-informed. So there's a whole sort of cascade of things going on. Tom on this and then back to Tasha. Tom? Yeah, I strongly agree with all these comments. And in fact, you know, we really want to get ahead of being diagnosed with a Lynch colon or rectal cancer. You know, that of course prompts questions and maybe elicits a family history. But what we really need to be doing is talking about family history much earlier on. Ideally, the handoff from pediatrician to adult medicine is a perfect time to discuss family health history. There's no point talking about it at age 57 when you have a stage four lesion. So this is extremely important, and I agree with Robin. There are millions of people in this country who have no idea that they are carrying a lethal, potentially lethal yeah. mutation. So we are trying to work very hard with multiple groups, including the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable, to develop tools and educational programs for primary providers uh, across the spectrum of provider settings, including our fantastic uh, federally qualified community health centers, which is uh, another critical platform on which to promote awareness of these issues. But family health history ascertainment is critical. So, Tasha, let me ask you, kind of a tough question that, that leads into the last couple comments. Are there socio-cultural or other reasons why people don't want to be aware, people don't want to recognize symptoms, people don't want to talk about family history? Does that arise? Uh, absolutely. Um, I can't tell you guys how, how often we've been at an event where we're talking about the signs and symptoms of colon cancer mm -hmm. and the people are looking at us like, wait, what? That's a symptom? Like they have no idea. Like it literally is teaching the ABCs to adults, you know? Um, another thing that came to mind after listening to all you guys talk is we did an interview uh, with this guy at our church. He talked about how important it is to be in the community. Yes. And um, this interview was probably about two years ago. And um, the guy said that when he had gone in to get his colonoscopy, that the, uh, colon, the colon rectal surgeon, surgeon said, hey, can I please take a picture with you? And he's like, why? He goes, I literally have been practicing here for over 15 years, and this is the first time a black person has ever come in here for a colonoscopy. So just to give you the an idea. The first time? First time. Wow. Yep. <laughs> so you can't even get into the cascade of success if you don't even get diagnosed. That's correct. If you're not willing to be screened. Yes. 
Candace? I, Are you yeah. serious? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were yes. ready to say something. Because I'm sitting over here like, oh, let me, uh, yes. And, you know, and on top of that is, you know, we've had health fairs, and there has been comments that have been made that I didn't know women get colon cancer. And it's like, are you serious? And it's like, anyone with a colon can get colon cancer. <laughs> you know, and it's- Do women but, have colons? Yes, yes, yes. That part of it. And you know, and, and, and it's funny, but then it's not funny because women are not being tested for colon cancer because they didn't realize that they are susceptible for getting colorectal cancer equally as men. And not only that, in, in the African-American community, there, especially in low-income communities, there are other medical issues of concern. So when we talk about getting a colonoscopy, that's so far on the list because they're dealing with high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and heart disease. So this year, what we did for our, uh, for our eighth year for Blue Hat Bull Tie Sunday, we did Pathway to Prevention. And this way, what we did was we offered high blood pressure screening, diabetes screening, cholesterol screening, along with moving them on into col uh, colorectal cancer screening. And we did this with our community health partners of four major hospitals and three major clinics in the city of Chicago. And all, the congregation all took advantage of these services. So this is, um, this is, a, for me anyway, a very important insight, and that is maybe we're better off looking at a whole set of comorbidities yes. that accompany people that are high risk for colorectal yes. cancer. If you're at high risk for colorectal cancer, especially in some particular communities, you may be at high risk for, well, heck, you said it, yeah. hypertension, yeah. diabetes, yeah. high cholesterol, and so forth. Yeah. So maybe there's sort of a broader embracing, uh, encompassing approach of saying, Look, we want to help screen you for a bunch of things that may, may hurt you now or down the line, which yes. is a very important, very helpful insight. Tom, I wanted to get back to you on the young people. Um, again, we, it sounds like you're sort of uh, committed to kind of bringing young people into the fold here. What are the particular challenges you see in so far as uh, getting young people to, uh, to get their level of awareness up, uh, understanding the risk factors, and so forth? Well, I think it's important to recognize that it's a major challenge. I mean, the young How people. How so? Well, the young people who are coming to our summits often uh, have been touched by the disease, so that, that brings them there. But uh, there's a huge, huge denominator of young Americans that we very much want to promote awareness of the disease. So, and, and, and in fact, virtually all of the of the groups working in the space are all actively working on messaging programs to that are devised to try and promote awareness among young people because because the delays in diagnosis are not only the physician who doesn't think of the possibility in a 32 year old woman it's also you know when you're 32 and you know you're ruling the universe and you're running 10 miles a day and you know, you're know you juggling five different jobs, it doesn't necessarily occur to you that you might have a rectal cancer. So we, you know, we need to work together to promote awareness in the full 360 mm -hmm. so, that, so that earlier diagnosis is, is possible. How do you grab the attention of a young person? Somebody may, entering college, just got out of college, you're in their first job, um, how do you, is it a social media thing? There are so many other things in someone's mind at that point in their life. We didn't discuss this, by the way. <laughs> yeah. He has to come up with a good answer on the fly here. Yeah, no, it's very important to, it's very important to convey that there are very talented individuals in this room and some of the folks on the next panel who are working actively together, maybe Martha can comment on this, specifically to devise awareness campaigns utilizing social media to help people be aware of the of the problem and you know all the, all the major foundations in this space uh, fight colorectal cancer the alliance uh, and, and many others are actively engaged in trying to address that challenge which so is huge we're still so, sort of we're learning still but how to how to find these people? How to alert them? Well, I I don't want to take up too much of the mic time, but but in terms of the epidemiology of young adult colorectal cancer, seventy five percent of all the cases take place in people age forty to forty nine. Uh -huh. All right, now that's not to say that's not to distance ourselves from people under forty. It's just to say 
that all of our current guidelines, which are based on people at increased risk, they all recommend starting at age 40 or 10 mm -hmm. years earlier than the earliest case. So I'm just underscoring that promoting awareness of risk, again, family health history, and then following the evidence-based guidelines we already have, which is not happening. There are evidence-based clinical practice guidelines out there. Yes. yes, but we're not taking the family health histories. It's very well documented. I won't bore you with the literature, but we all know the literature. <laughs> we're falling short along that line. We're absolutely. Martha, on this point. Well, I think, I think a kind of a two-prong approach. I think that you know, understanding, you know, reaching younger people where they are. So they're not watching the 630 News, for example. They're, <laughs> they maybe are on social media. They maybe are on YouTube. And I think one of the biggest things to that point is for individuals that have been diagnosed and they're younger, as we've said all weekend, is to share your story so that they understand someone like Candace. You know what I mean? Or someone like Vanessa or someone, you know, they, they, look, they look like someone like Peg, someone young, that they say, oh my gosh, if it happened to Peg or Candace or Vanessa, it could happen to me. I think that's really important. And I think the other aspect is, I think it's a two-way street. I think it's, it's educating our clinicians. Maybe it's the fellows that are coming up. Because it's, um, I think it's the old, um, I think it's the old, uh, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you hear hoofbeats, you know what I mean? Don't automatically think a horse. You know, you might think it's a zebra. You can't, like, you can't always think, oh, it can't be colon cancer. You're too, too young. I mean, how often have we heard that? So I think it's a dual messaging. I think it's meeting people where they are, mm -hmm. whether if that's a clinician or if that's a younger, younger person, and or the family as well, if it's a family history to know that, and if someone had polyps, if someone had a uh, colorectal cancer, or an associated maybe Lynch syndrome cancer, endometri endometrial or something along those lines, to know those Point well facts. taken, point well taken. Uh, Robin, on that point, as far as right. reaching? So it's, it's, a, it's very daunting to look at the numbers for Lynch. Um, one in 279 Americans means there's a million and a half Americans out there mm -hmm. walking around at an increased risk for multiple types of cancer and don't know it. And they're of different ages and they have got family members that are likely affected as well. And so it's reaching not just individuals but their families of different ages. And, and um, we, it, it's, it's very daunting. We're one of the things that we've um, started looking at and are, are going to be doing is awareness um, at the college level. Mm -hmm. um, we've always incorporated soccer. Alive and Kicking kind of got the name because my husband has been a lifelong soccer player and fan and coach. And um, so we actually did an awareness night, a Lynch syndrome awareness night at a um, St. John's College soccer game. Shout out to Shannon over there um, last fall. And we're looking to implement more of those so where we can um, be at the game and talk to uh, college age students um, about their family history. And it's amazing how many kids um, came up to us and started asking questions and started talking about <coughs> their parents or their grandparents and um, got that family history conversation So it going. sounds as though there are a multitude of targeted efforts. Mm -hmm. Go find soccer players, right? right. And potentially mm -hmm. soccer moms and soccer dads and soccer right. girls and so forth uh, in that case. Candace, I want to turn to a point you made earlier, and this is back to the to the socioeconomics. Okay. And we're talking about access here. Um, <coughs> now, well, with the partial pullback, I don't know what the right word is, of the Affordable Care Act, uh, with the price of therapies going up, uh, a lot of people under financial stress, to what extent from a socioeconomic standpoint is financial access at risk now to help your patients? Are they seeing any of those hurdles? Yes. How so? Well, there are already financial issues that they're dealing with. And so now with the pulling back, you're, you're having uh, FQAC uh, uh, centers closing. 
federally and qualified fe health centers. Yeah, fellow, mm -hmm. federally qualified health centers closing and merging with larger hospitals. So that's putting a distance now where they used to be able to go to a clinic, now they have to travel even further to go to a hospital. Mm -hmm. And so if they're already under financial constraints, that means that they have to travel even further, costing more money. Um, and then it all depends on what, you know, what the insurance that they already have. If they're on Medicaid, if they're on Medicare, uh, these, are, you know, these are issues that, that's going to affect them anyway. And a lot of, majority of uh, low-income communities are dealing with Medicaid. So this is going to impact them. And, and not to mention access to particular medications. Uh, co-pays, there's a patient that I, that I mentor now, her co-pay for her medication is almost $2,000 a month. A month? A month. Does she hit a threshold where she doesn't have to do that anymore? Is it no. every month? That's, that's after, oh still 2000 a month. So this is, and can you imagine, this is what's happening to her, this is one person. So, and she's taking a pill, she's not even taking a full treatment. So the median, median U.S. income is 56000 Depends on and where she's, you live. What, right, median, <laughs> right? Depends on where you live, For the yes. whole country. Yeah. Um, and she's showing up 2000 a month. That's and, she's not e and that's not even her income level. And she sounds like she's well below that. Yes, yes. So if that's happening, can you imagine what's happening everywhere else? Is she having to make choices about seeking care? Of course, of course. I mean, I, I, that's evident. Do I, take, do I spend yeah. the money on the medication or do I eat? Uh, you know, do I pay rent? And she's had to have assistance paying rent. She's had to have assistance, you know, trying to get the medication. And thankfully, because of some of the support groups, she's been able to have some of the medications yeah. and somebody even donated the medication to her. Wow. But I mean, this is just one person. So Tasha, when you uh, work with, with uh, patients and families, how able do you think they are to sort of navigate this system? I mean, some people are Medicaid, some elderly people are Medicare and so forth, some people are commercially insured. Are people equipped to sort of not only get into but navigate the choice making yeah. of colorectal cancer? It's really hard and confusing. Um, I, as a nurse, you know, I you feel are. like I'm <laughs> very smart, you know, and I can understand stuff pretty well and I have a hard time trying to figure things out. Um, and in some places they do have like nurse navigators, <laughs> um, people that are helping to kind of bridge the gap because these patients are, they, you know, they have specialists, they have, you know, a doctor over here, a doctor over there, and trying to get everyone on the same page. I mean, it's quite difficult. Again, for someone who's fully immersed in it, I don't really even understand all of it myself. So with, with these hurdles then, do people end up going without indicated care, whether it's a financial hurdle or just I can't get the system? Do people actually A, miss out on care and B, have substandard income uh, outcomes oh absolutely we were having a conversation at dinner last night where someone was going in for a colonoscopy and with the loophole which is a huge issue that we're currently working on um the person told the doctor if you find something in there while you're doing a colonoscopy just leave it there because they can't afford the bill afterwards so they have to tell someone that before they go under mm -hmm. anesthesia yep but of course they're not going to do that. Good. Uh, what's that? <laughs> but, but of course the doctor's not going to do that. Yeah, but the bill's going to be there when they it come is, out. Eh? It is. But it, I mean, and, and that's where they're foregoing getting the colonoscopy because they don't want to come out with a bill. So then have, wanting to avoid that potential financial impact, mm -hmm. they will avoid the colonoscopy, not get screened, yes. go longer before it's, I yes. get it. Wow. Yeah. Tom? Yes. It's, it's understood, just echoing your point, that outcomes, colorectal cancer outcomes, and for other cancers as well in the African American community, are worse for all stages of disease if you control per stage. And this is largely understood to be the result of socioeconomic issues. I mean, that's the most polite way you can put it. Be but, impolite. But, what but, is it? Well, <laughs> access to care, quality of care, and uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just an enormous, overwhelming financial and logistic struggle to secure quality care, uh, even if it's close by. Yeah. So, you know, th this is a major national concern, which we seem to endlessly struggle to address, but it would really behoove us to do our best to address it. Well, it's you're not, sitting in a state, right. you're sitting in a state right now that is haggling over <coughs> Medicaid, expanded Medicaid access to a lot of underserved people. This state? 
Virginia, right now in Virginia, <laughs> you can see DC over there and that way is Maryland, but right now you're Virginia, so uh, they're still fighting about that. Martha on this. Well, I think it's a kind of a double-edged sword too because so many times uh, in the young people, again, they can't get the colonoscopy. Even if they're having the, the symptoms, the doctors won't take them seriously or they don't know that this could be the situation. So not only can they not get the diagnostic um, experience, um, but then if they are diagnosed, it's probably at a later stage because they, they waited or someone else waited. So they can't afford the colonoscopy, but then they really can't afford the treatment. So it's, you know, you're, you know, it's a double-edged sword. It's, you are. Uh, and you hear that so often, you know, as Candace was saying, it's just heartbreaking. Candace, and then back to Rob. Candace? Yes, I want to elaborate a little bit more on the, on the minority community. African American community, it's a, it's a, it's a history of I don't want to know. And history of I don't want I to don't know. want to know. I mean, and there's been so many times that we've gone into communities and like, you know what, I don't want a colonoscopy. I don't want to know if there's something wrong with me. I'll, you know, I'll be okay. I'll die the way I came. Or it's, it's, it, is, um, it is one of those things where it's like, you know what, um, I know someone that died from mm -hmm. having a colon, you know, mm -hmm. from having colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's never, but it's, and it's the fear. There's no hope. And so if you don't see images of survivorship, you don't think that pertains to you. And so that's what's been so important to me by, uh, by me going into communities and showing them that you can survive this disease. And the main reason is that people are afraid to get colonoscopies because they hear these stories. Oh, the prep is the worst thing. And I'm like, the prep is not your problem. <laughs> and I tell them that this is, this is what you have to deal with, 15 minutes or 15 years. And they're like 15 minutes or 15 years, 15 minutes for a colonoscopy or 15 years trying to survive and deal with a cancer diagnosis, which is how long it has taken me. And so that's what the message that I give. Well, <laughs> by the way, thank you very much for that. By the way, we're gonna, at 10 minutes before the hour, we're gonna go to Q&A, which is not five minutes left, by the way. So <laughs> at, uh, at, 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 at three, okay. Uh, at 3.50 or thereabouts, we're going to go to Q&A, and then we'll finish up at the top of the hour uh, on that. Candace, just it prompted another question. Maybe sure. this has to do more with clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Is there still a Tuskegee effect going on in Absolutely. cancer care seeking? Absolutely. Still? Still. Because the public health service, that, it was 1972 mm -hmm. when that came out. That's a long time it ago. It is, it is. And that's, is that still at pl in play? That is the first thing that comes out when we talk thing? about clinical trials. And it's a, it's a history of non-trust. And it's, it's ancestral as well as it's systematic. And so if, that is, if you continue to hear your grandparents tell you these stories about what happened and that, that's why they don't go to the institution and go to the medical institution, then that's what you're gonna take in. And then you see, issues or you or you read about it and you go oh no you know what I'm going to be a guinea pig this is not something that I want to be involved in so yes it is it's continuous and then we have to explain that there have been uh, things that have been put in place now you know like the uh, um, uh, IRBs in place yes. now to help you know pr to help support and protect human studies but it's still you still have to continue to having the conversation that's that is still a to hurdle fear. absolutely even today even today Good yes gosh. we had the all of us van at our church last year uh, in September, and the conversation kept coming up over and over again, everyone that came into the van. Yet another hurdle. Yes. Yes. Uh, Martha Raymond, I uh, want to uh, go back to the caregiver issue, because we started out by saying, how well are we covering the various stakeholders and, pay and, and subgroups going on here? Uh, tell us a little bit more about, A, why the caregiver is essential, and B, how good are we, how well are we doing at accounting for the role of the caregiver and protecting him or her and providing him or her support. Sure. I would just be curious, how many caregivers here do we have today? Nice. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, Large percent. Yeah. And I think probably that question I should pose to all of you, but I think one, th one thing I would say is that, you know, so, so often what I hear from caregivers is, you know, if you could do anything to take away the pain of, the, of your loved one that's going through the experience, you would. And that so often, you know, you kind of feel helpless because you're doing everything you can to help your loved one. You can't take away their pain. You can't find the cure. Um, and so it's a very difficult situation and something that there really isn't training for. I mean, some people are very compassionate <laughs> and may have that you know, maybe a little bit more of an innate ability. But then there are other people that, you know, you have your own life, you have children, you have 
uh, you know, parents that you may need to be helping. You have a career. And so you add on the caregiving responsibilities, and it's, it's kind of an overwhelming task. How well many, are we many. doing, though? How well are we doing at supporting these folks? Caregivers, I mean, I don't know. I don't think we're doing great, to be honest with you. Um, I would be interested if anyone else had a different opinion. But I, I think there's so much more we can do, and, and that's one thing that if I can do anything to help, that's, that's my goal you for know caregivers. Who to talk to. Robin, I'm sure you have a view on this. Well, yeah. I mean, for us, it's kind of multiplied as a caregiver because I am now not only a caregiver for my husband and everything he's been through, but my children now, my, our oldest son is lynch positive. Mm -hmm. He's a previvor. So he uh, tested positive for a lynch mutation when he was 18, which was four years ago. He's 22. Um, so he has now had his fourth annual colonoscopy, uh, MRIs, uh, ultrasounds, urology appointments, dermatology appointments. So he's already caught in that whole web of of, of screening, a, yeah. screening and appointments and follow-up um, and all that. So he's 22, and he will have to have those for the rest of his life. My 18-year-old just went in for his genetic testing, and we have a 14-year-old that will also need to be tested in a few years. So you, I haven't heard the, the term was previvor. 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 So previvor okay, is pre the term used for somebody that tests positive for a hereditary cancer mutation that mm -hmm. increases their risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. but has never had cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, based on earlier conversation, you're pretty well off. Um, how tough is it economically and from a time standpoint to be a caregiver? Well, it, it's very time consuming. Um, so, uh, we, you know, we're juggling everything. You know, my, for example, my 22 year old is in college and he goes to a school that runs on a quarter system. So mm. he comes home for a week at a time, four times a year. And we are, and he spends probably three of those seven days when he's home that week at doctor's appointments. Wow. Um, and he's 22 years old, so he's, uh, he's, uh, so I'm the one that's managing, making those doctor's appointments, making sure he gets to them. And that's not including my husband's doctor's appointments. Oh, God. So he, yeah. what's the sort of bottom line net strain on you and your family for the <laughs> caregiving function? How would you characterize <laughs> that? Everything. Uh, yeah, Everything. It's, it, it, it's stressful Everything. because, you know, um, as we've heard, and we actually had a conversation about this this morning, it's not if, it's when. And so, right. you know, for everyone, you know, in that position, you're you're watching with the hope that whatever you catch, you're going to catch really early. Okay. Because you are going to find something at some point. So part of caregiving then is anticipation, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of <laughs> looking over your previver, right? right? It's not just dealing, with, not only dealing with people that have the condition, are getting therapy. It's looking out for somebody who's at risk. Right. That's part of caregiving. That I had never occurred to me. I can say that. And so the Martha. <laughs> it's, it's the fear and, and the anxiety. We all know of scanxiety when you're going for a scan and there's all that anxiety. But that's true for the caregiver as well because, yeah. you know, you're feeling those emotions too, just as the patient is. Did you say scanxiety? Scan yeah. Anxiety. <laughs> oh, my vocabulary yeah, is increasing by leaps and bounds. This is wonderful. I, uh, def I definitely had a much more emotional reaction to my son's first colonoscopy than he did. I can imagine. <laughs> I can yeah. imagine. Okay, um, we, doubt, we now will go to audience Q&A. Now here's, here's the arrangement. This uh -huh. is like a Washington thing, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> and I, l those of you uh -huh. who don't, I, I kind of know that whole skyline out there. Most of you can actually see the tip top of the Capitol where they do a lot of, uh, a lot of this stuff. So here's, here's my thing. Uh, we want a question. We don't want a speech disguised as a question. <laughs> We want a concise question, and we'll do our best. We'll try to give concise answers as well. Here's what I'm going to do. Question one, question two, question, there was something in the question three, ma'am, there. Question one, and please give your name if you don't mind. Uh, what age are they going to speak to? Let's get the microphone. Um, I have Lynch, and I have 16 and 18-year-old. My question's for Robin. 
how how does um, life insurance affect your children? Did you get life insurance for them okay. before they were tested? So, we we life insurance is not covered under the GINA Act. So the GINA Act was passed in 2008 under President Bush, and it is the Genetic Information Non Discrimination Act, and it prevents health insurance companies from discriminating against a genetic condition as a pre-existing condition. So it, it helps to secure um, patients with Lynch um, with health insurance, but it does not um, protect them in terms of life insurance. So uh, we actually, believe it or not, forgot to get a life insurance policy for our oldest before we got genetic testing done. How old, um, how old was your son at that point? He was 18. You had to be thinking about life insurance? So we, yes. So we, this time, with our, our, our second son, who just turned 18 in the fall, we just got him a life insurance policy. And we said, you know, we've got to try for Zach, our oldest, even though he's a Lynch positive, we need to try and get a life insurance policy. Um, so we just went through the process of applying for his life insurance policy. They did not ask on the application about a, any genetic um, diagnoses, but they do ask if you've had any diagnostic testing over the last mm. year. Mm. So we had to is explain and give doctors information about why our 22-year-old was getting colonoscopies and MRIs. Uh -huh. So we just went through the process and I think we're approved for a life insurance policy for him and it's costing us twice as much as it cost for our 18 year old. There you go. I'm sure the story is much more involved, but that gives us enough of an idea how difficult it is. So it's very important. Also represents being able to get the life insurance. Yes, it, yes, absolutely. Practical advice. Yes, ma'am, question number two. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you so much. Uh, most of you guys I know. Um, my name is Valerie, and I'm a stage four colon cancer patient. Um, I touch base on every single one of you guys' story. <laughs> um, family history, my brother died in 2010. Um, I was tested genomically for Lynch syndrome and hasn't been classified as conclusive or inconclusive as of yet. I am working with Dr. Lynch on that to find out the severity of it. I have a 24-year-old daughter, and as Candace said, she's at a point where she doesn't want to know. And my thing is to get her to understand the severities of knowing and the fact of prevention. We have done blood work and things of that nature with her, but as I said before, I touch base on all of these things because I'm my own caregiver. Uh -huh. so you I'm still dealing with that pain and not knowing if I should go to chemo or not. Um, right. You know, where I'm living, how I'm functioning. Um, I'm grateful for many organizations and foundations that have been supportive of me and have kept me as long as I have been living. But dealing with that and knowing that there's a time limit on me, I was diagnosed in 2015, this is 2018, and you know you have that 11% of stage fours last the five years, that approach is coming up. And Got that's it. so in my daughter's mind. And my thing is, how do I get her to get more active and to get more understanding and feel comfortable about this situation? How does she get her to be more active? Martha, maybe Tom, what do you got? What do you have? You know, I, I, would, I would think, you know, it might be something, and I know Candace and my daughter as well, and, and Tom's and, and Robin, um, all of our children have, have kind of become involved in our organization. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you that's say to true. her that this is something that's meaningful to you, and it could be meaningful for your mother-daughter relationship, I think she's old enough where you know you can try to kind of use that angle. I hate to say that, but with our kids, we all know we sometimes we have to go that way. Mm -hmm. But just to say that it could be something meaningful that you could do together, mm -hmm. and and maybe if you approach it that way, that it's it's something that's important to she you. She's there, and she does think it's beautiful. She does the unmute with me. Oh, She'll come great. to NCCA and sit mm -hmm. with me. But I'm talking about getting in her mindset to know oh. about the severity of what she has. Tom, done. do you have a thought on gotcha. that? Tom, and then Candace. Well, can quickly. you can you Put the genetic testing issue as, aside temporarily and just really try and focus on her clinical surveillance to protect her. And then, you know, because if I may, you know, she'll have some experience of that, but 
it's not a given that when she's tested, she's going to be a carrier. So, you know, she has a shot at not being a carrier. So as she gets familiar with what life might need to be like, if she doesn't really know, she might want to know. Okay, Candace, briefly. Listen, <laughs> <laughs> just simply say this. You know how it felt when I went through cancer? Reverse it. No mother wants to watch their child go through the same things that we went through. So it's important that you get tested and then don't give the option, period. I mean, this is the, this is the point where the, par the parental unit has to step in and say, I cannot give you this option to wait. You need to get tested. Let's go get tested. And set the appointment. That's it. Make it happen. It's so that's it. Send. I, I, have, I manage five girls. Every last one of them that were aged to be tested, I fought the military for my two oldest to be tested. You can do this. You set the stage. Get them tested. Point well taken. Thank you. Send uh, Candace. Uh, we'll make this the last question from the okay. floor. Your name, please? Carlene Taylor. And my 22-year-old son was uh, diagnosed with colorectal cancer 2016, passed away at 23, seven months later. But I'm going to add really quick right up here. Uh, after he got diagnosed, and passed away in September. I had three other boys. They had no option. They had the appointment, and I got them in for their colonoscopies. I, I was not taking no for an answer. And after they watched their brother suffer and die, you know, it didn't take a whole lot to push them, but they had no, I was gonna drug them and take them in there. They had no <laughs> choice. Okay, yeah. but here's my question, yes, okay? Um, and this, I'm not quite sure who would answer it, and it might be more political, but I was his caregiver. And um, I, ha I went on FMLA and used all my FMLA. And then after he passed away, I was a basket case and had very little FMLA left. And so then I went on short-term disability. Um, but my question is, we tried to get, you know, I have three boys. So we tried to get the one son who was working at that point to get FMLA so that he could help us. And we were told, no, you can only either have a spouse or you can have a parent. Mm. So yes. what yes. needs to be done yeah, in those situations yeah. where you can get like a sibling involved yeah. to, you know, that he could have taken his brother to the doctor's appointments Absolutely. or to the stuff, but it, it all, the whole burden it's fell on me and my it husband. It is a big burdensome issue. Any, any takers? I see sh head shaking <laughs> up here. Hand us what do you have? I, you know, I would, I would suggest you talk to Cancer and Careers um, because they were very instrumental in helping some of the patients that I manage uh, talk about, you know, talk to their employers about um, the FMLA Act. Unfortunately, that's, that's an issue that is a governmental issue. And I'm, you come to Washington, D.C. Right, I mean, that's something that right Hill, that's apparently. another thing to add to, you know, to a lobbying plate, but yes. other than that, there's, there's really no change to that. Yes. And, and thank you for sharing it, and thank you for sharing the photograph as well. We appreciate that. I have a closing question for our panel. We haven't discussed this before. We make it really tough for them. I'm going to ask you a question, and you need to answer it in one sentence, and don't, no dittos are allowed. <laughs> okay? And so Tom just went like this, so he gets to go first. So... Um, we started this conversation by asking you kind of when and how you started your, your organization. You are founding people. Uh, Tom set a good example. Here's the question. Since you founded your organization, what insight have you gathered that you had no idea was going to occur to you when you founded your organization? What have you learned about patient advocacy in this field? Or what dawned on you that said, gosh, I had no idea when I started this organization? What's, what's one thing that had da has dawned on you? Tom Weber. Well, you need to reach out. You need to collaborate. You need to partner. You need to build a network. And you need to never, ever, ever give up. That's a sentence. Thank you very much. A few commas, but it works. And then Robin. Um, I think one thing that has, I guess, amazed me about the patient community, um, the colon cancer patient community and the Lynch syndrome patient community, is how eager the patients and advocates are to contribute in a real, substantial, meaningful way, whether it's calling on Congress or participating in pa our patient registry to provide their information for research. Um, they want to 
and are eager to make a difference. Excellent. Thank you very much, Robin. Good insight. Martha. One voice can make a difference, and that voice can be yours. Ha. Great take-home message. Thank you. Tasha. Um, I would say um, how easy it is to uh, get in front of this. We talk about social media. And so our thing, Blue Shoelaces, you'd be surprised at how easy it is to connect with people. And so we have the Blue Knots Initiative. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tasha. Wouldn't have thought of that. Candace. Follow your passion, no matter how goofy it may seem, because I promise you I thought Blue Hats was not going to take off. And I just thought, um, but it took off, and I realized that there were more people looking for me just like I was looking for them. Excellent. Well stated. In a moment, in just a moment, I'm going to ask our panelists, our panel number two, to get real ready to jump up here and take these lavalier mics from these folks so we, we, so we can turn this around really quickly. But before we do that, before we do that, I have learned a lot. I've learned four new vocabulary words, for one thing. Uh, but honestly, um, this panel has been straightforward, full of candor, ready to go, assertive, and not taking a single step back. They provide a lot of really pragmatic insight. And for that, uh, Candace Henley, Tasha Keel, Martha Raymond, Robin Dubin, and Tom Weber, we thank you for this excellent panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, Candace Henley has a final comment. Can I just say one thing? It is our duty to talk about your booty. <laughs> Public service announcement from Candace Henley. All right, I'm going to ask you all to, to gently leave the stage, and uh, panel two has to come up.